Our second scripture reading comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, and can be found on page 115 in the New Testament, if you'd like to follow along. Hear the word of the Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Then they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever run into someone you know really well and you don't recognize them because they're out of context? Like, you're at the grocery store and you see your kid's teacher, your grandkid's teacher, but you don't notice because the teacher isn't in a school setting. Or you're on vacation somewhere or living in a new town and you see someone who seems familiar. You can't quite place the face and you end up saying something like, you seem so familiar. Eventually, you realize you went to high school together a thousand years ago, but you're out of context. That messes with our recognition factor. Now, celebrities are really good at toying with recognition factor. They'd have to be, or they'd never have a moment's peace. But you don't even have to see someone face to face to have that kind of out of context experience. Years ago, when I lived on Long Island, I answered the phone at the office. Middle Island Presbyterian Church, this is Twyla. And it was my ministry buddy, Anne. And she identified herself, and I relaxed, and I greeted her with excitement and enthusiasm. And she laughed at me and pointed out the vast difference between my professional phone voice and my talking to a friend voice. Even over the phone, we have a recognition factor. But we don't often think of God as having that recognition factor. We have certain ways that we expect God to be. We even have expectations of how God looks. Close your eyes for a moment. Yes, really. And picture God. Okay, you can open your eyes. Did you picture an old man with long flowing hair and a white beard? Or maybe that famous scene from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with Adam where they're just almost touching? Some other version of God that you have seen in art? Maybe you pictured a youngish guy with long hair and a beard wearing a tunic and sandals, maybe with a crown of thorns. Or maybe something that you have seen in nature, out in the woods, or some other thing that represents God to you. But the point is, I would guess that almost everyone here pictured something. Did anyone not picture anything? We all have some mental image of God 
But we have no idea what God looks like. And even people who have seen God face to face did not always recognize God at first. Moses recognized that there was something up with that fiery bush. But when he approached, he had to be told to take off his sandals, for the ground he walked on was holy. He did not recognize God until God identified himself. And that was at a time that people took seriously the prohibition against making images of God. Even then, seeing God and being told that he was seeing God wasn't quite enough for Moses to really recognize God. Moses saw and yet wanted proof, asking for God's name. The disciples who walked with Jesus during his earthly ministry knew him intimately. They had eaten with him and traveled and suffered and taught and slept in the same places as our Lord Jesus. Yet when he came to them, after his death and resurrection, they did not recognize him at first. Some of them didn't even get it when he first spoke. They followed what they were told to do, but didn't recognize him. He was out of context. Out of context more than anyone else. After all, he'd been dead. But in today's gospel passage, you see the third resurrection appearance. So it's not the first time they've seen Jesus after his death. Jesus is telling the fishermen who have spent the night fishing in vain to cast the net over the other side of the boat. And when they do, the nets were full. Well, we've seen this before, right? When Jesus first called the disciples, that's kind of how the scene began. You remember the story from Luke chapter 5, the one where Jesus tells them that he will teach them to be fishers of men? It's the same kind of thing. They've been out all night fishing, hadn't caught a thing. He says, try the other side of the boat which was just not a thing that fishermen did, but they tried it and ended up with nets full of fish. Having been, this, been through this before, you'd think the disciples might have caught on a little quicker, but the whole thing was so unbelievable, they kind of missed it. Jesus was out of context. It took a little while for them to recognize him. And then he broke bread with them, and they really believed it. God doesn't change. But we fail to recognize him. We become complacent, thinking we know how God is going to interact with us, thinking we recognize a pattern, recognize God. And then God does something so unexpected that we struggle to recognize God's face. And God does this over and over again, from the beginning of time up through this story and on into today, and will continue to do so into the future. For God has always done this. God has so many different ways of showing himself to us that there is really no surprise when we don't recognize him. Like the disciples, we aren't always looking. We think we know where we'll find God, how to see him, as if God could possibly be contained in a single place or a single pattern or even a single pronoun. Now, while I don't believe that God has a gender, I do tend to refer to God as him, partly because the English grammar person in me just can't do that singular entity with a plural noun. It just bothers me. But I also have been known to refer to God as her, not because I think God has a gender. God created a gender. God can be any gender God wants, even genders we don't know about, and that's okay. But it's just easy. And I tend to picture God on the rare occasions when I even picture God as either being surrounded by so much light or the source of so much light that I can't really see him, except in the vaguest terms. We all get some picture in our mind and don't, be able, don't seem to be able to see God's face when the way God is presenting himself to us doesn't match that picture in our heads. But God does show his face in unexpected ways, and unexpected places, and sometimes in unexpected people. I know I have seen God's face in the face of others. I don't always recognize that in the moment, but when I do, those moments stick with me. In hospitals, people are often seeking a way to see God's face, whether they realize that's what they're doing or not. There was this one woman at a church I served named Sandy, 
She was our fill-in musician much of the time and even took the whole shebang on when we were between musicians for a while. But her regular job, her real job, was being a nurse. And I actually saw her at a hospital one time doing her job when I was visiting a patient. I got to see her before she saw me. And I got to watch her interact with the families of the patients that were there. And there was something different about Sandy in that setting. She is always loving and lovely. But in those moments when she offered comfort to a family, even a family that she knew, there was a different presence to her. It brought a certain peace to those around her. And that peace seemed to kind of hover around her. And I realized she was the face of God for many who were scared or lonely as they waited for procedures and news of the outcome facing their own mortality. I've seen God's face in the checkout man at the thrift store, the toll collector in the booth, the harried shopper who takes a moment to notice the mom struggling with the buggy and trying to get the kids in, and who holds the door anyway. The dad who volunteers with the youth group or the scout troop or the sports team. The person who comes to Cameron Ministry for food, but blesses the workers who are there. And so many more places. But I only see God when I really open my eyes. So, microphone carrier, get ready. I didn't warn you. But it's your turn. So you're going to have a moment or two while we get ourselves ready. And then some of you are going to tell us where you have seen the face of God. You don't have to know the name of the person. It doesn't even have to be a person. But I'm sure there's at least a couple other people in this room who have, even after the fact, recognized they've seen the face of God somewhere else or in someone else. So you ready? Okay. Okay. If you can think of a time or a place or a person in whom you have seen the face of God, put your hand up so John can bring you the microphone. Excellent. Thank you for playing along. I love audience participation. Oh, Linda's got one too. Yay, Linda. This is so coincidental I can't even believe it. Uh, yesterday evening I'm walking McLeod on the canal bank and this quite attractive lady approaches from the other side and wants to talk to McLeod. And suddenly she said to me, what is your name? And I said, Zeke. And she said, I'm Karen. And we talked for a few minutes and she said, can I pray for you? This is on the canal bank. <laughs> I said, well, sure. And she said, can I touch you? She put her hand on my shoulder. <laughs> it was unreal. Um, not intimidating, not awkward, and we talked for an hour, and I met a friend. I mean, that was just, it blew my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Others? Don't be shy. When, uh, a long time ago, when my husband was ill and on hospice, we had a nurse named Karen, who was clearly in the right profession as a hospice nurse. There was just a presence about her that was very calming for me and for Bob's family. And um, it just it made a bad situation a little better. Yeah. Anyone have one that wasn't a person? I would have to state uh, I was really down in uh, my life and I went to Killington, Vermont during the winter time to ski and how beautiful especially on the gondolas and the chairlift and uh, even though it's like top of the mountains the seven mountains that they had at minus 40, it was, it was a beautiful sight. Anyone else? 
Anyone ever see God's face in the face of a pet? I a, have. Few, a few years ago, um, I belonged to a group on Facebook <clears throat> that tries to save dogs from the New York City shelters, which kill dogs frequently. And I had seen one, and I waited till Saturday morning, and <clears throat> nobody had reserved her. She was very young. So I reserved her, and I told Cliff, don't make any plans, because we got plans for the weekend. And we drove down to New York City, and we rescued her and brought her home. And she was so thankful, just her face. And like, she's still with us, and she's the biggest baby. And every time I come home, I see her, and she's so happy, I think. What a great thing that we did for her. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? It's okay, you don't have to share. But I can see on some of your faces you have those moments in your head. I will tell you that I have one friend who is an atheist, actually. Um, but there was this dog. There was this dog. It was his sister's dog. And the dog was not well. The dog had been diagnosed terminal. And he was totally broken up. And when I say an atheist, I don't just mean like a, he doesn't show up at church. I mean like an avowed atheist. But that dog was so special to him. That dog was so loving and so kind and so generous and so sweet and so affectionate that he actually called me and said, do you think Millie will go to heaven? It made me cry. Because that dog was the face of God for that person. It doesn't have to be human. It doesn't have to be where you expect. But God shows his face in all kinds of places and all kinds of people and all kinds of critters and all kinds of beauty and in the most unexpected ways. God is all around us every single day, if we will open our eyes and be brave enough and have the patience enough to take the time. But to see God, to recognize God, we must expect God to be active in our lives. We must learn to focus on things of God's kingdom rather than just all the stuff of the world, or we might miss seeing God when he's right in front of our face. We have to be willing to let go of our limited images and understandings and look for God wherever we go, even when he turns out to be a her sometimes. And we must do one thing more. We must realize that sometimes we are the face of God for someone else, the only face of God that someone might ever see. And we must live in a way that leads people to say, you seem so familiar because they recognize God's face in us. Amen.